song, it tells the story of our Savior. I want you to listen to the words and let it remind you that we serve the King of all kings. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
love these moments together. And I love songs like this that remind us of the Word of God and how important it is to our lives and a standard and a firm foundation that we can hold on to in times that are crazy. This past week, I don't know about you, we've had so much kind of revelry and fun here in our city. But then more than ever, we're more acquainted with what war and rumors of war look like. And for me, it creates this tension of like trying to relax and enjoy and celebrate some of the fun things we have, but then recognizing that we live in a very intense world where, where sin has, is having a really crazy impact. And you're seeing choices of leaders and the war that's going on in Ukraine right now, and it, it just creates a tension. And for me, it's in moments when I'm still trying to love my kids and love life, but then I'm still facing with something that's never happened in any generation, that we're getting a front row seat to what the pain of war looks like because of our social media world. And when things like this happen for me, I, I find myself having to come back to God because I have questions like you. You ever had a moment where you saw something that was just overwhelming and hard? And you thought, God, why, why is this happening? And what I love about the Bible and even reading the one year Bible is that when you go daily to the Word of God and you bring your context and you bring your problems and what you're facing, that is something about the Word of God that, that the, the words just lift off the page and speak to the issues of your life. And this morning, I was reading the one year Bible before all the services early. And, it's kind of still my tradition. It's before I study for messages. I try to go to the Bible and listen to what Jesus had to say and how it points our attention in times where things are hard. Mark chapter 13 and verse 5, Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but, but don't panic. Come on, say those two words. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains, which with more to come, kind of scary thought, but there might be more challenges that we'll have to face. And today, as I was reading this, I was reminded that God didn't promise us a life without trouble. He didn't promise us a life without pain or challenge. He promised us a way through it. Amen, everybody? He promised that you could overcome the evil that is in this world. And so rather than being overcome by what you see, you should endure. You should press on because God foresaw that these things would happen. And He has given us the power to endure. He goes on to say, when these things happen, watch out. Come on, say those two words. Watch out. You will be handed over. You might even face local councils. You might even be beaten in synagogues for your faith. You may stand trial before governors and kings because you're a Christian. He says, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Come on, right in the middle of the challenge, he said, you'll have an opportunity. He goes on, verse 10, for the good news must be preached to all the nations. But when you're arrested and when you face trial and when you go through hard times, I want you not to worry in advance what you are to say or what you are to do. Just say what God tells you. I love that. Hey, what has God been saying to you? Have you been in this word and has he been speaking confidence to you? Has he been giving you strength to make it through the day? He ends it by saying, just say what God tells you. It is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit through you. And though you may face hardship, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Today, I want to remind you that what is going on in the world is harsh. It's overwhelming. But God has allowed sin to run its course in this season so that he can save many. And that may feel overwhelming to you, but today we have a calling to stand firm, to press in, and to trust God. I love it. Psalm 49, one year Bible again says, As for me, God will redeem my life and he will snatch me from the power of the grave. Anybody say amen in the room. 2 Timothy 4 and 18, come on, if you're gonna clap for God, give it to him. 2 Timothy 4, 18 says, but God will rescue you from every evil attack and he will bring you into his, safely to his heavenly kingdom. Today, I wanna take a moment to pray for the people of Ukraine. But I also want to pray for some of the people in Russia who are opposing evil. And I want to pray for a godly resolution. Would you join me at home in the room? Heavenly Father, today we stand upon your word. And God, we see wars and rumors of wars. 
And God, we see evil dictators doing evil things. And we ask, oh God, that you would save many. That in the midst of this hardship, God, you would save lives. And God, I pray that our nation, you would give us resolve on how to stand and what to do. God, I pray that you would speak to our leaders, that we would save those in Russia and those in Ukraine, God, that we would prevent further calamity from happening in our world. God, we ask that you would give us the endurance. Come on, just pray, God, give me the endurance and the fortitude to love you in this season and to trust that you're working for our good. God, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name, we all shouted amen together. Amen and amen. One more time, would you give the Lord the best hand clap of praise that you can? You know, there are moments when you see so much that you have to come back to the foundation of your life. And in today's service, I'm going to help you to remember that you have a firm foundation in God, that you can trust Him in the midst of storms. If you're here for the very first time, my name is Josh, and I like to say sometimes that I'm not always this fired up, but y'all know I'm always this fired up, all right? So what hope would you say hi to our first timers? Come on, we're glad you're here. Hopefully you found the coffee in the hallway, our incredible kids' services. If you brought a little one into the room, we got a mom's room in the hall down this uh, to my right, your left. And if your little one starts just acting up, we'll, we'll help you find a way to, to bring them back there. You can watch the service in each of these environments so that you can still be with us. We got a great day prepared for you. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds. I want you to say hi to somebody you don't know and then grab your seats. Let's do it. and I serve on the kids team. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, we know that God has something special planned for you today. If you're new to One Hope or want to learn more about who we are as a church, we would love for you to join us for Next Steps. At Next Steps, you will have an opportunity to become a member of One Hope, take a personality and spiritual gifts assessment, and find out how God uniquely created you to make a difference. Next Steps takes place each Sunday at 1030 a.m. On your way in today, one of our greeters handed you a worship guide. On the inside cover, you'll find out more information about the church, such as the free coffee in the hallway, our children's services that take place just down the hall, and the mother's room for moms who need to care for their young children. You will also find what we call a connection card. When you fill it out, the connection card does what it says. It connects you to the church. But don't worry, we give you the hassle-free guarantee. No one is going to call you or come to your house we simply want to send you a letter from our pastor welcoming you to the church. At One Hope, we are a church of small groups. We believe that the relationships formed in small groups are vital to our spiritual growth. Finding the right group for you is easy in our online directory. There are plenty of groups to choose from and the directory will help you narrow down which ones might work for you. You can filter your search by day of the week, time, location, type of group, age range, and more. Then, simply sign up for the group you are interested in, and your small group host will send you more information. You can find the online directory at onehopechurch.com connect, or by downloading the Church Center app from the App Store. Come on, church, help me say hi to those who are watching online right now. Come on, give them a great hand. Thanks for joining us today for church. 
I always like to take a moment just to talk to you at home because I realize with so much going on, there's always uh, challenges with family and football games and festivals. And we just finished up Mardi Gras around here. How many of y'all enjoyed Fat Sunday last Sunday? Come on, it was a lot of fun. Lots of, lots of king cake around here. And I always like to just take a moment to say that we'd love for you to come and join us in person. We have an incredible environment here that if you're enjoying it at home, I think you would enjoy the hugs and the handshakes and the people meeting you and, and inviting you to be a part of a vibrant community. Amen, everybody. And we got a great time. I do want to celebrate though last Sunday just a little bit because we did something for the very first time. We've never done this as a church and that we had what we called Young Communicators Sunday. We had four different communicators bring the word of God. Can we celebrate the four of them kind of stepping out, overcoming their fear? You know, a top five fear, the, the, the number two fear of all time, you know, is, is uh, standing on a stage and having people look at you and talk. Uh, you know, what's the fifth top fear is dying. And so standing on a stage, people are more afraid of standing on a stage than dying. Isn't that crazy? And so I just got to give it up to y'all for, for overcoming fears and, and for some of the very first time and stepping out and, and also declaring what you believe and sharing personal parts of your life. I, I know sometimes we make it look really, really easy around here, but there are lots of hours that go into someone standing here and sharing God's word to you because we don't want to take it flippantly or as happenstance or something that's uh, unimportant. It is very, very important to God. And so the people who who stand up here as well, who lead worship. We're, we're building and developing character in their lives and also calling forth the gifts of God in their lives. And I'm just thrilled that we have a generational church that young and old and black and white and brown and every background and every heritage you can find is celebrating and worshiping Jesus together. I think it's a win and I just thought I'd tell you about it, all right? Now today, kicking off a brand new series. And, and the title for the series is, is Sound Doctrine. Would you say those two words with me? Sound Doctrine. I know it's like the, it's the sexiest of titles I could have picked for this series. You're like, pastor, like, could you, could you have come up with something that like would draw in the loss? Yeah, yeah. Sound Doctrine, you know? If you wanted that series, that was the last one. It was called Love, Sex, and Relationships, all right? Because some of y'all got people to church that never were going to come to church on Sex Sunday, all right? That's like, you're like, I'm coming for that one. Uh, today, I want to. I want to build. <laughs> that was funny. I'm sorry, but uh, I want to. I want to build a six-week series. I'm just telling you ahead of time what we're doing. It's going to take us all the way to Easter. And for some of you, you're newer in faith. Some of you, you've grown up around faith, but you're really newer to what it means to have sound doctrine in your life, to have core values and beliefs that you hold to that guide you in your life. And today we're going to establish what that is and where we find it. And, and it's going to be a little more teaching heavy than some of my other messages. Lots of verses. This would be an incredible Sunday to grab the worship guide and write some things down or to go to onehopechurch.com and, and click download on the message notes because I've got some lengthy verses that I need you to see, and I'm going to do the best I can to finish it all on time. Can I get an amen, everybody, right, to, to finish it all? But here's what I know. I, I want to seed your thoughts. I want to help you to grow because it's important, but you're going to have to do some homework. You can't just worship God for an hour on Sunday and expect for God to change everything in your life. You're going to have to worship God daily. You're going to have to build some of these truths into your heart and mind so that you will mature and so that you will grow. And so regardless of your level, you should understand because the Bible isn't hard to understand. It's sometimes hard to do. It's not hard to understand the principles of God's word. It's just challenging when the Bible says, pray for and love your enemy. I'm still trying to love people that I like. Loving my enemy is taking it to another level. I understand what you said, God. I'm just challenged in the situation to actually live it out. And we're living in a culture that is very, very challenged when it comes to core values and principles. This week, I read about a five-year-old little girl that was in class, and she was just all out cheating in class. I mean, just all out cheating Y'all know, like, not even hiding it, just like, what you got over there? You know, like, just like, five-year-olds are good for this. So, like, and, and the teacher said, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, you're cheating. She said, uh, she said, I'm not cheating. I'm just helping myself win. <laughs> it's a very funny thing that, just like you, I laughed out loud when I saw it. 
But the danger is that if someone doesn't correct that five-year-old, they grow into other kind of people in the world, right? They grow into people that invade countries because they're able to manipulate ideas to become truths that they want, not actual truths. And so they justify all sorts of evil things that happen because nobody walked up and said, hey, no, we don't do that around here at five years old, right? Hey, there are rights and wrongs in the world, and you and I didn't get to pick which ones are right and which ones are wrong. I know for each better than y'all are amen and over right now because you can already feel where I'm going. But there is this culture, again, of just like, hey, I get to do what I want. I didn't write the list of sins. I didn't come up with them. And just like you, I need the grace of God to overcome sin. I'm working just like you to follow Jesus, to mature. But in order to do it well, we've got to have some soundness to what we believe. Let's begin. First Timothy chapter 4, first lengthy passage. Paul says to a young pastor, be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the, say it with me, and of the sound doctrine which you have been following but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. <laughs> Sorry, older ladies. <laughs> Paul just threw some of y'all under the bus right there is what he did. He said, on the other hand, on the other hand, listen to how strong his language is. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline only profits large biceps, everybody. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for, for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God, not a dead God, a living God who is the savior of all men, women, and children, especially of believers. Listen to the words again. Prescribe and teach these things. So what should you do with the Bible? Prescribe and teach these things. Give attention. What should you do? Give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Why should you come to church in person? Why should you go to church at all? Because the Bible challenges you to give attention to the public reading. Pay close attention to yourself and to your same word, doctrine. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation. What? You can ensure your salvation? Like, I can buy insurance. I can make sure. Yet yeah, you can ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Sound doctrine is so important so that you can have confidence that what you believe is actually true and not just some guy in a cool shirt standing on a stage telling you a good idea. Some of y'all laugh too hard. It's okay. We need to go beyond a lecture and we need to go beyond an idea and we need to dive deep into what we believe. Doctrine, let's define it very clearly on screen, is a clear collection of teachings from Scripture. It's just a very clear collection of teachings from Scripture. Before I could give you some clear collections before I could take you to the next teaching, which will be week two and week three and week four, I need to establish with you today that the Bible is sound doctrine. Say it with me. The Bible is sound doctrine. All of it. There is no other place that you're going to find sound doctrine other than the Bible. There are some great orators there are some incredible writers, even in our modern age, great theologians, love them, but they don't stand not even an inch in comparison to the strength of the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Your Bible is sound doctrine. What does that mean? Well, man, there's a lot there that we can learn. There's a lot that we can dive into and I'm going to help you to establish it as sound doctrine for your life because as the world rocks to and fro, the only way that you and I are going to endure, as we talked about a few moments ago, is that we have a foundation that's based upon sound doctrine, something that is not based upon fable 
or someone else's crazy idea, but is actually founded upon the word of God. Let me take you a little bit deeper. Here's where you need to start writing some things. Why, why the Bible? Why is it so important to us? And why is the Bible sound doctrine? The first thing you need to know is that the Bible is actually God. It is God. You say, what, what, wait, that paper? No, 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 that's paper, okay? The words are the words of God. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word, say it with me, was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. John, the writer of the uh, the book of John, walked with Jesus, was close with Jesus, laid his head on his chest, the Bible says. He's using the exact same words of Genesis 1-1, that every person who knew and understood the Old Testament as the Bible of their day said, in the beginning, God. He said, in the beginning, Word. In the beginning was the Word. You cannot separate the Word of God from God. It is God. Secondly, it it is inspired by God. Some of us, when we think inspired, we think like, like Pastor Josh really inspired me today. I, I get it. But inspired, the word literally roots in the breath of God. So it is so much God that it's literally God breathing on you. Think about it just for a moment. I mean, God's got the best breath in the world. Amen, everybody? He don't need no peppermints, right? He just, when he breathes, it breathes life. <laughs> Sorry. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture, how much of it? How much of it? What about the verse you don't like? (laughs) You understand the tension, right? Because I got to love the verse I love and I got to love the verse I don't love. I got to deal with the tension that comes with having verses that create tension in my life. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I like teaching. I don't like reproof and correction. Anybody here? For training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You feel ill-equipped for your calling? Go to the Word of God. Because it's there to equip you to become all that you're supposed to be. It is God. The Word is God. It is inspired by God. It's literally his breath into your life. See, it's not just, hey, we're just reading, we're reading that old history book today. No, no, no. It's the breath of life. It breathes something into your soul. Number three, it is also unchangeable. I love this about the Bible because people change, but the Bible does not. And I'm going to break this down for you a little bit later in the message, if I have time, okay? But uh, but it is unchangeable, meaning that the boundaries of the Bible have been so established, and there are so many copies of it, that though, yes, people do try to manipulate the Bible and do evil things with the Word of God, godly men and women can grab hold of that sound doctrine and say, no, 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 you have taken an obscure verse to do an obscure thing, to justify you being an evil dictator, and that's ungodly. Can I get an amen? John 10, 35 says, the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. The word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. It is unchangeable in our lives. And if the word of God is changeable to you, if you can say, I believe this, but I don't believe that, the danger is which part do you get to hold on to? People say, man, I love, I love those verses about forgiveness and grace and mercy and and all dogs go to heaven. That's not a verse, by the way. But I don't like that verse about tithing. I don't like that verse about giving and being generous. I definitely don't like that verse about loving my enemy. See, the, the challenge is, is it's unchangeable, so I have to deal with that tension, which is like talking to the five-year-old and saying, no, no, cheating is wrong. First Peter 1 and 23 says, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last, how long? Forever, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. The word of God is eternal. It is living. It is unchangeable. Number four, why the word of God, it leads us to Christ. 
it leads us to salvation. It leads us to overcome our sinfulness. Romans 10, 4 describes it this way. It says, for Christ is the goal of the law. Christ is the end. What, what are we trying to attain? You're not trying to look like me. You're not trying to look like your favorite theologian. You're not trying to look like anybody in culture today. Doesn't matter how much money they make. Doesn't matter how popular they are or how many Instagram followers they have. For heaven's sakes, follow somebody that has two followers and you might have a greater impact in your life than someone who has millions. Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The scripture was given to us so that we would understand that we could have sound doctrine in our lives so that we could become like Jesus Christ. 1 John 5 and 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. These things are written so that you and I would be saved. You say, saved from what? Same from my past sinfulness. Same from my present sinfulness. Saved from my future sinfulness. See, God's work began in us, is continuing in us, and will be with us as long as we will be with him. There's a confidence that comes when you begin to build the word of God into your life. You re realize that I just gave you four points and like 74 verses. Why? Because this is not my opinion. I didn't come up with this idea. For heaven's sakes, I don't think I could come up with an idea that would be so prevalent in the world as what Jesus established when he came to this earth some 2,000 years ago. He began something and he is doing it. You say, okay, pastor, I understand. You read me a lot of verses to confirm that the verses are good. But, but, you know, what, what about the, what about, you know, like, what is, what, what, what is the Bible? Because there's this denomination over here has some books and this denomination over here has some ideas. What, what is the Bible? Well, the Bible is broken up into two major sections. And some of you, again, some of you, you're going to say, oh, pastor, this is like a beginner course all over. Some of you need a refresher course because you've got a five year old that's been cheating. Okay. <laughs> the Bible is broken into two sections. The first section is the Old Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 of 66 books, 39 of 66 books. And the Old Testament, a lot of people try to say, oh, I don't like the Old Testament because there's, there are lots of wars and it seemed like God was killing people and, and God was like, it's just, it's, there are plagues and, and there's, there's genocide. Yes, the Bible is true history of how God engaged with evil people how God saved people who needed to be saved. And so you will find yourself in the Bible if you're willing to look there. But so many of us, so many of us, again, we want to say, well, that, that's old test, that's law. That's law. You know that when Jesus and the Apostle Paul were preaching, that they didn't have the New Testament because they were living it. So you know the only Bible they preached, the only word they quoted, was the Old Testament, the law and the prophets as they referred to them. The first five books are quite often referred to as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law. And every Jewish boy and girl by the age of 12 had to memorize the five books. Think you got it hard in fifth grade. Try to memorize Leviticus. Jesus, again, knowing that this tension was being established in Matthew chapter 5, says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to, say it with me, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. The Old Testament is the word of God. The second part is what we refer to as the New Testament. And the New Testament is 27 books of the 66 books. And the 27 books, they pick up a historical context about 430-ish years after Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And you find yourself with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are four different people telling the same story that happened at the same time. Y'all with me today? Yeah. The New Testament 
is the word of God. It has been established. Now, there are some denominations that they like to to graft in what is called the Apocrypha, 14 books, and they add them to the Old Testament. And some of those books are useful, and they're even cool. They're just not equivalent to the other 66 books. Y'all following me today? And so they're fun to read, but you got to be careful because they say some crazy things, and they don't fit within the boundaries of the, the other 66 books. So you can get some weird doctrine out of them. 1 Corinthians 10 11 says, These things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So these things have been done so that we would learn from them. And so Jesus actually was fulfilling much of the Old Testament prophecy right in front of them so that they would trust that he was the Messiah. Y'all follow me today? Am I going too quickly? There were some 400 prophecies about Jesus and what he would look like and where he would come from, that he would be from Nazareth. And these children who were raised to memorize the law and the prophets had been told about these 400 different prophecies about Jesus and so that they would recognize Jesus when he walked in front of them. And so when he walked in front of them, they had to say, well, wait, wait, didn't Deuteronomy 18 say? Didn't Moses say that there would be someone who would come? That would stand, that would affect all. Yes, yes, that he must be the one Moses talked about. And when Isaiah prophesied, y'all following this? Jesus fulfilled and fulfilled and fulfilled and fulfilled and fulfilled. And the fact that he would fulfill five of them is mathematically impossible, but for God. The fact that he fulfilled hundreds? Y'all follow me today. I have a hard time fulfilling what somebody told me yesterday, tomorrow. (laughs) Jesus isn't my good idea. He's the son of God and the savior of the world. But the New Testament, I think, and I imagine myself sometimes, what it'd be like to be, to be one of the disciples walking with Jesus, like just hanging out with him, like kind of going through this, and even to be one of them after Jesus ascended into heaven. Like what it'd been like, and they begin to recognize that they were joining with the Old Testament prophets. In the early first centuries, you're talking about 100 AD and 200 AD, The gospel was growing and growing and growing and growing. And they wanted to make sure that they had a clear history and a clear understanding of what was actually happening. And so they begin to realize that just like when the prophets were prophesying, that the apostles were actually writing what today we would recognize as scripture. Listen to how Peter talks about Paul. I kind of like this. These are two guys that butted heads. He says, and regard, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom wisdom given him, wrote to you as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort. As they do the rest of, say with me, the rest of Scripture. He said, people are twisting up Paul's word just like they twist up Scripture. Here's Peter walking alongside another brother apostle and realizing that what Paul is writing, that God is actually establishing Scripture, and Peter begins to honor and say, just like they're trying to twist the Old Testament, they're trying to twist Paul's words, but Paul's words need to be honored because they are leading us to God. The Bible is really, really important. It is sound doctrine. It is what I am building my life in our church upon. And yeah, I'm trying to do it with our New Orleans flavor of ice cream. Trying to have a little bit of fun with it. Some people say, you know, pastor, should you have a Sunday that you call Fat Sunday? I said, only in New Orleans. And yes, like Mary Poppins, I think a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. 
And I work incredibly hard to, to find that sugar to help you to, to, to take into the word of God and let it go deep into your heart and life. But, but please, please don't take the humor and the laughter and those, those, uh, peripheral things and miss that we are built upon sound doctrine that has not changed and will not change. And we're going to pass the baton should Jesus tarry to the next generation that's going to be a founded upon sound doctrine that will not change, that will persevere, that there will be a church that celebrates the name of Jesus Christ in this city. We will stand upon it. We will be it. I love, I love what God is doing with our, even our new building right down the road on Paris Avenue because in the late forties, early fifties, a Presbyterian group of people, another denomination that's different than ours. Any Presbyterians in the room? Come on. Any Presbyterians in the room? <laughs> what happened to y'all? I know there's gotta be one. Okay. I'm going to be the one. I'm not Presbyterian. All right. They planted a church based upon the same Bible you and I believe in. And that church grew and lasted until Katrina destroyed it and they were not able to recover after it. And it sat vacant for years and years and years and another group recovered the property and tried to begin but couldn't complete it. And I believe that property was preserved for us to be a faithful voice in this city that God said, that's hollow ground between those two oak trees. That's hollow ground. And that's going to be a place that declares the name of God, not only for the past generation, but for future generations. Why? Why? Why would God do that? Numbers chapter 23 and 19. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? And will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? That's the verse you ought to memorize. Because God said it, he'll do it. I love some of my friends. They, 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 they coined the phrase, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Come on, you turn on some gospel music and somewhere in the middle of that, won't he do it? And they're going to start, they're going to start doing what I call the chicken dance in church. You know, they, they start, you have not been to church if you have not seen somebody chicken dance at least once, all right? Now, I will tell you, I will tell you that some of you who've never been to church that's that lively, that we try to temper some of that, all right? We try to, we try to say, you know, like, you know, don't scare the new people, all right? <laughs> but there's something about being excited about God. Something about being excited about God. Can I take you down a little bit further down the trail? Y'all with me? The Bible is so important. And we can trust it because it's been historically proven. It's been historically proven. If you will do just any research, and let me give you a couple of maybe books to look to. Go to, to Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, and he'll establish a historical timeline for you. Go to josh.org. It's not my website. It's another cool guy. <laughs> another cool guy who wrote volumes And his book that I would encourage you to read is called A Ready Defense by Josh McDowell. And in it, he just establishes the historical evidence. Today, if I asked any of you if Shakespeare lived, you'd say, absolutely, Shakespeare lived. You know how many original manuscripts, like actual things we can say Shakespeare wrote? You would say, I have no idea. But you believe in him still. Why? Because you've been told to believe in him. Shakespeare's original writings, we have about 1,200 original manuscripts of the plays and the ideas that he wrote down. You know how many we have just of the New Testament? 24,000. So you say, well, I don't know if I can trust the Bible. Well, can you trust that Shakespeare lived? Listen, at some point, you're going to have to stack up the historical evidence and say, the Bible stands better than any other. Secondly, you can trust the Bible because it's scientifically valid. It was not written as a scientific book. It is not a science. (laughs) We're not going to biology 101, all right? But I'll tell you that science has been discovering what the Bible declared thousands of years ago. And so if the Bible's declaring things that science said, I don't know if that's real, and then science discovered it's real, shouldn't we trust that the Bible stands differently than any other book in history? It's the number one best-selling book of all time for a reason. And it's still continuing to be that book because men and women smarter than all of us put together have tried to destroy it. And in the process of trying to destroy it, became followers of Jesus Christ. That's Josh McDowell's story, by the way. 
Josh.org, read his testimony. He was an atheist who decided that he was going to do away with Jesus and he was going to destroy his impact on the world. And he thought the only way that he could destroy is if he destroyed the Bible. Because if I could get rid of the historical context and I could disprove it, but then he dove in and what he found is God is God. And Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world is what he found. The Bible is historically proven, scientifically valid. Number three, biblically canonized. That's a new word for some of you. But in 397 AD, a bunch of theologians got together and they said, we need to, we need to make sure that we have clear context, historical data that proves who wrote these things, who said these things. And the word canon literally means to measure them effectively. And so they used a litmus test, a very clear, like, could we find out who wrote it? Where were they? Did they preach similar things as Jesus preached that we know? We know this book is right, but does it match up with this book? Y'all following this? And they stacked them all together, and they they came up with the Bible canon. They canonized the Bible, and they wrote and said, you could trust these 66 books. And as I said to you before, there are other books to read that are useful but are not equal to the 66. And so I put all my attention on the 66 books because it's hard to read all of them every year, y'all. I don't need 14 more. Can I get an amen? Number four, why should I trust the Bible? It's because it's experientially enjoyed. That if you'll dive into it, you will find the breath of God. If you'll dive into it, you enjoy. Oh, I, church can be like, I've never been to a church. You know how many times I've heard people say, I've never been to a church like this. And it, it's, it, it kind of frustrates me a little bit because this is church. This is what it looked like when those young Jewish boys saw Jesus walking by and he said, come follow me and I'll make you something more than what you think you could ever be. I will call out in you the purpose that I placed inside of you. I will develop something in you. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. I'm already running late. Mr. Piano Man's on his way right now. <laughs> this is what happens to me when I take a week off. Here's how we're going to close. I want to give you three things that if you'll, if you embrace sound doctrine, very quickly, if you'll embrace them, this is what they will build in your life. This is what sound doctrine will give you. Number one, sound doctrine gives us a foundation to build our lives upon. So many people are saying, what should I do? What should we do? Where should I go? What is the purpose of these things? Why are there so many wars and rumors of wars? Why are there still famines in the world? God, where are you? God, why are you allowing these things? And he is. It's one of the hardest things for you to deal with, and that is that God has allowed sin to run its course for a short season. He's allowed it to run its course because this life is a test, a trust, and a temporary assignment. He's allowed it to test our hearts to see what we'll do, what he trusted us with, whether we will endure till he takes us home. And that may be hard for you to swallow as you look at wars and rumors of wars. And I understand that. You may say, well, pastor, that's a very flippant and quick answer. Let's go deeper in the sound doctrine if you'd like. But you need this foundation. You won't make it. You won't endure. You can't make it without this. Listen, when it all goes crazy in the world, I go to the word of God. I don't go to the news. I don't turn on social media. I go to the word of God and it informs me. It founds my life. Titus 1 and 9 said, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Hebrews 13 and 9 goes on to say, do not be carried about by the various and strange doctrines for it is good that the heart be established by grace. You need, you need a heart to be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Don't get so caught up with what's over here, what's over there, and what you're going to eat and drink. Establish your life on sound doctrine. Number two, sound doctrine sets us apart as followers of Jesus Christ. 
It's the word consecration in scripture. It says that God consecrated them. The word literally means that he set you apart as different. There's a reason why you're saved. To be a faithful witness in this generation. To find a way in the midst of your friends to say, hey, what do you think about God? Have you considered what's going to happen after this life? Ask some questions. Why? Because there's a reason you're here. Titus Timothy 4 says, For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. You've been set apart. That's why you're here. You've been set apart, young lady. You've been set apart, young man. You're not here by accident. You're not in this city by accident. God has you here for such a time as this. You say, well, pastor, I'm only here for six months or two years. I got a job or I'm finishing up this degree for such a time as this. God called you here and you can be a son and a daughter in the house for the season you're here. And you can take this with you to the place that God calls you. But you've been set apart. Second Timothy 4, 3 says, for the time will come when people will not put up a sound doctrine. Instead, To suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This is where we are. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me my truth. You want to hear my truth and I'll hear your truth? No, no, no. There is only truth. Why is the war in Ukraine wrong? Why? Why is it wrong? Because God's word has established what is right and what is wrong. And it is wrong. It is wrong to attack people who have not attacked you and to murder them without cause. It is wrong. And so I stand against it. Amen, everybody? Number three, and we close. Sound doctrine focuses us on the purpose of God. When you have sound doctrine, you'll stop chasing squirrels. You'll stop chasing money. You'll stop chasing girls and guys and jobs and things. It will focus you on something that is bigger and what the job is there to support and what the job and the money is there to make a way for, the gospel. Isaiah 55 and 11 says it this way, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God, sound doctrine will give you a purpose for your life. Some of you have said, I don't know why I'm here. It's time for you to get in the word again and trust God. Amen, everybody. So we close, would you bow with me in prayer at home in the room? With every head bowed and every eye closed today, if you've listened to these words about Jesus and you felt this tug of war going on in your heart, you're just listening to these words. And in this tug of war, you realize that you don't have a real and vibrant relationship with Jesus. Maybe like me, you grew up around religious things. Maybe you've never heard these things, but you feel this tension on the inside. That's God drawing you right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand. I will not ask you to come to the front. You can make a personal and private decision to begin a relationship with Jesus. But here's what I know. At some point, you're going to have to answer that tug of war. You're going to have to answer that calling of God. And if that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer of faith. Say these words right after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life on my own? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name, just a moment longer. Heavenly Father, as we continue to study your word, I pray that our lives would be founded, consecrated, and purposeful because of our sound doctrine. Come on, just breathe in the Spirit of God just for a moment. Open your heart. God, I pray that we would be founded, that we would be consecrated and purposeful because of our sound doctrine. God, we receive it by faith today, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. We all said amen together. Amen and amen. Would you clap for those who prayed that prayer of decision? Come on, give them a great hand. 
Hey, if you prayed that prayer real quickly at home or in the room, grab the connection card. Let us know about your decision. If you're at home, text my decision to 94253. We'll send you some next step information. It's so important to us. We don't just pray the prayer. We want to help you grow in sound doctrine. So let us know you made the decision. We'll help you to take next steps in your faith. If you came prepared to worship God with your giving, go ahead and get that out and ready. Y'all know you can give so many ways. Text to give online, in person. As we go, you can put your connection cards in the buckets by the doors as well. Your giving is making way for us to be here today and to build that over there. And so thank you for your faithfulness. Please consider, please pray and say, God, how should I be a part of building this building? What have you called me to do? And just do whatever God calls you to do. Amen, everybody. There's never going to be pressure in this environment environment, but I'm always going to cast vision for you to say, God, what should I do? Last couple of things. Remember, communion's available. Prayer team's always down front after. And then right down the hall at 1030 a.m., we have a next steps class to help you grow in your faith, to help you get connected to the body of Christ. All right. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray over our offering. Our offering. Ushers, if you want to take your place, we always do something on the very first Sunday of every single month. We make a faith declaration about our giving. It's going to be on screen. Let's say it together. It says, we tithe, give, and serve to honor God. We steward well to impact the world, and we trust God to provide more than we need. Heavenly Father, as we give you our best in tithes and offerings towards the building that you've given us, God, and towards being the church that you called us to be, God, I pray that you'd fill our hands, you'd multiply it, and that we would make a difference for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, we all shouted amen. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.